Okay. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another thriving artist profile. Daniel Merrick, she's not an artist, but she's got a thing or two to say to artists, so stay tuned. She has been an associate staff director of the Entrepreneurial Legal Services Clinic since 2004 and is the executive director of the Kansas City Volunteer Lawyers and Accountants for the arts since 2010. That's not always a combination that I see. So that's right. pretty cool. Um, and the two are definitely linked. Uh, Professor Merrick earned her Bachelor of Social Welfare from the University of Kansas and her JD and LLM in taxation from UMKC. Previously, she was employed with the American Century Investments in tax, the tax department and worked on individual and corporate tax forms. She was also involved with launching the state of Kansas 429 plan, which I have no idea what that is. What is that? Uh, that's like a college savings plan. Oh, nice. Okay. So I asked Daniel to come and talk to you because she actually, as the executive director of the Kansas City Volunteer Lawyers and Accountants for the Arts, knows a thing or two about the challenges that artists encounter. And you were mentioning, Daniel, that you can go, you can go to one of the art schools and talk to the graduates about some of the hurdles that they're going to encounter. So right. what I wanted, I know you've probably got a wealth of information, but I would like you to just share, if you had to give a future artist or a current artist, like three things that they should absolutely be doing or thinking about, or if you could just tell me what their top three problems are that you deal with and what the solutions are, that'd be a great place to, to start. So what's number one? Like what's the big breakdown problem? That number one is I see a lot of artists that enter into collaborations with other artists and they don't outline what all of the specifications are going to be. Nobody knows who's going to get paid for what, who's going to own what, who can do what with what going forward. And a lot of times what they've essentially done is they've formed a partnership unknowingly. And sometimes that set them up for intellectual property issues like copyright or trademark issues that sets them up for potential contract problems. It sets them up for potential tax problems if they've started a partnership and they didn't even realize that that's what they've done. Yeah. So can you give like one, re like one recent example and you don't have to name names, but <laughs> where this went down, where you, so I recently had a client who went into an agreement with another artist. They decided that they were going to make a performance art piece together. It was going to be a film. And there was no written documentation between the two of them. And now one of them is trying to sell the film and is not getting the consultation of the other and is also refusing to give her any copies of the film or anything of that, even though she worked on the film with the other person. That's not good. No. Okay. So you can file copyright jointly, by the way, everyone. I'm not an attorney. I'm not giving legal advice, just basic knowledge that you can file copyright registration and you can put more than one name on it and outline uh, who, which, which, who the intellectual property belongs to. Right. And this is key because intellectual property is a very vital current or future financial financial asset for artists. This is where, you know, this is where the money is. Um, so that's a great example. So had, if you could suggest they should have done, what should they have done? Well, they should have done, which is also the number two major thing that I see artists get into is all of your contracts should be in writing. Absolutely. And what a lot of artists don't understand is that an email exchange between two people can count as a writing. So if you've got someone who doesn't want to sign a written contract, you can simply send them an email that says, hey, Sue, nice to meet you today. The way that I understand it, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. You're going to pay me this amount, and I'm going to deliver such and such by this time. Is that what we agreed to? And when that person just responds back and goes, yeah, that's it, 
that can count as a written contract. That's a really perfect, perfect practical example. There is a reluctance, I think, for a lot of people, not just artists. Sometimes they're, they're friends. They decide to go into a venture together. And they don't want to somehow strain the relationship by putting it in writing. But in fact, sure way to hell is to not put it in writing. It's when you're going to lose your relationships because that written contract forms the boundaries of how you're going to interact and divvy up the debt or divvy up the liability or divvy up the profit. So, so glad you said this because I say this all the time, put it in writing. But that's a really great practical example. Just have an email exchange, outline it that way. Because here in Kansas City, we have quite a few people, probably because we're it's Midwestern nice. A lot of people are kind of like, I don't want to do it in writing. I just want to do everything on handshakes. And and I'm like, email, just do some emails. And you yeah. So it. I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Ohio originally. And there's a joke. It goes, if you're from New York City, F you means hello. If you're from Los Angeles, have a nice day means F you. And if you're from the Midwest, F you means F you. And have a nice day means have a nice day. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so number one, just partnerships and being really clear that uh, that include that intellectual property belongs to each of the creators. And number two, put it in writing, put it in writing, put it in writing. Yeah. And what's the number three challenge that or hazard that could be avoided that you have encountered in your um, role as executive director? Number three is just things dealing generally with intellectual property, copyrights, trademarks, etc. Um, a lot of artists don't understand that they have some common law rights and copyright the second they create something in a fixed tangible medium. So the second you paint that picture or you write that story or you record that music or you even notate that music on ledger lines, you've created something that you have the ownership of the copyright to. And so that means that even though you haven't registered it, you have some rights with that. And so people, a lot of artists short sell that. They don't think about the fact that, that they should control those rights and really try to control how those rights are distributed. On the flip side of that, a lot of artists, especially my filmmakers, musicians, and some of my visual artists will accidentally not meaning to start infringing on other people's work. Mm. So some of my visual artists, especially the ones that work in collage, mm -hmm. they will frequently not think about the fact, oh, I cut this magazine picture out and now I'm putting it in this collage and it's like, well, that picture belongs to somebody else and you technically have to license that. Right. Or my filmmakers will have music playing in the background and they don't think about the fact they need a sync license for that. Yeah, and I think it's also important to understand that you need to get that permission. So first of all, let me just back up like five steps, what copyright means. It's the right to copy, mm -hmm. literally copy something, right? In, in recorded form, in visual form, you're not allowed to copy anything unless if someone else, that someone else has created unless they've been dead a long time, right. unless you have it in writing. Is that right? It's got to be writing. Yeah, that's what we would call a license agreement. And copyright, since it's based in property law, it is one of the few contracts that's required by law to be in writing. An oral agreement does not suffice. Thank you for saying that, because I say it all the time, but... Um, this lady has a lot more education than I do in law, so you got to listen to her. She knows what she's talking about. She's not only an attorney, she's a professor. She knows what she's talking about. She's telling you, you've got to have it in writing, or it doesn't right. mean anything. And I can give you a practical tip with this, and, and yeah. I see this all the time, is that as, as an artist, if you find someone has started infringing your work, the 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 instant response is to go out guns blazing. Oh my God, yeah, you stole that's how I feel. I just want to, I just want to, I just want to chop their head off. Right. Well, so uh, someone I work with says, think of an a friend is someone who's infringing on your work as a potential business partner. You just have not yet met. And so oftentimes if you send that person, you say, Hey, I noticed that you're using my work. I'm really flattered. Here's my standard licensing agreement. You're just, absolutely right. That's a very, 
That's great. That's a great suggestion. So what you got to do is actually have one at the ready because people are going to infringe on your copyright. Right. Yeah. So I always advise my artists to have a licensing agreement so that if they have someone infringe, they can just send that out and say, hey, here's my licensing fee. And then if they don't pay the licensing fee, then you can decide to get your guns blazing out if you want to. So when you say get your guns out blazing, I'm just going to, let's just talk about the practical matter of enforcing copyright. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, you know, so it's federal, it's a federal and international law. Actually, our copyright law, I believe, is based in the French copyright law, if I understand correctly. Yes. So this is an internationally respected um, law of order. And so that means that there's different courts and different types of legal representation that's kind of expensive. But I will say one thing that I did way back was I actually took someone to small claims court mm -hmm. and I won. So um, what would you recommend? So let's say you send them a cease and desist. Let's say you sent them, first of all, you said, thank you very much. Uh, you're, I see you're interested in my license, right. my work. Here's my fee agreement. And yeah. here's when that check is due. Make sure you include that. Right. But let's say that doesn't, they don't respond to that. They either don't write the check or they don't take it down. What's the next step they take? So the next step is like what you said, sending that cease and desist letter. And the cease and desist letter, I always err on the side of saying, I will, ta I will take further legal action if necessary. Mm -hmm. I don't tell them what other legal action I'm going to take. I don't bind myself to taking legal action, but I tell them I'll take further legal action if necessary. In my experience, most people at that point will take it down. Right. Because a lot of times people who are infringing, they're not really meaning to. They just don't have the knowledge to understand that they're infringing. A lot of times they just saw something cool and they put it up and they didn't think about the consequences of that. I see that and then I also see people who do actually know better, but they think they just they play dumb. Yes, of course. <laughs> Ignorance is not a defense in the law of copyright. So. Just about to say that. You took the words out of my mouth. Exactly. Okay. So, all right. So, Danielle, they've, they've, they have sent the um, carefully worded, I will take further legal action if necessary. Now, let's say that doesn't work. Now, what's right. their next step or remedy? You can certainly do small claims court. Uh, d and the limits for small claims court uh, in terms of how much you're trying to recover depend. They vary from state to state. Right. You can also file a federal claim if you have your copyright registered. If your copyright is registered with the Copyright Office, there are certain statutory remedies that flow from that, dealing with um, statutory damages and attorney's fees. For my small artists, it becomes a layer of practicality. You know, if this person's infringing how much money do you want to throw at this problem? Right. Because, um, you know, y you have to pay the filing fees and then you have to go actually litigate it. And, it, you know, sometimes them just getting the court, you know, the, the case filed is enough for someone to go ahead and settle or stop or whatever. But, you know, it depends on the issue and who is infringing and how much, you know, where they're located, how practical it is. Yeah, I mean, I actually, my producer from Creative Live um, went on to produce a piece for a startup here in San Francisco, and um, they decided they weren't going to pay him. So I said, file, they don't own the copyright. They can't use the T, they can't use that footage for their TV commercials. So he went ahead and registered the copyright. He should have done it before, but he didn't. That's okay. He registered it. And then he um, sent them a letter to say, you know, you use it. It's not just, not just that you're stiffing me. You are now in violation of copyright law. So of course they wrote him a check. So having it and having the register, even though he didn't had not yet received the copyright certificate. Right. I think by showing them the, that he had registered. Yes. His, property, not their property, his property, um, that helped him get paid. So um, if nothing else, it can just take, you know, help you um, make your case. It helped me in small claims court to have my certificates at the ready. Yes. And what it means for everyone, if you're not sure what that means, you, the damages you can recover are much higher when you have your copyright registered. Is that, that's one way to put it. You might have a better way of expressing it, Daniel. No, I, I think that's a great way to put it. And um, 
one of the things that a lot of artists don't recognize also, like especially photographers, someone who, who's doing, you know, they might go out and have 45 different, you know, prints or something like that, is that you also have the option to register something as a collection. Yes, and that saves you a ton of money and a ton of time. And um, I recommend that what people do is they inventory uh, their images or their designs or whatever, or music, and just put it in a spreadsheet and so that you've got a record. And I always use a unique identifying code, a num numerical code. So I'm very organized and because titles can be, I'll get confused real quickly. Um, but a number um, never gets confused. And so it kind of acts like the serial number. And then, um, you know, that it's sort of like, you know, it's like a bank account, you know, you gotta, you've got to keep things in order and you have to know where things are at and uh, you can register in a series. I think it's like 45 bucks now for a copyright registration fee. Yeah. You can, you can register everything for 45 bucks. And, right. and the process is not that hard actually no. read the directions. You don't need a copyright attorney. I mean, do you, do you think someone needs a copyright attorney to register their copyright, Daniel? No. No, the only time I would say that you need a copyright attorney is if there's some kind of um, debate into who owns it, yeah. so some sort of collaborative work, or if you need to litigate it for some reason. But otherwise, no, registering a copyright that you singly created without any debate or whatsoever, that's very straightforward. And you can actually call their office. And in my experience with the U.S., I've called them and sometimes... I mean, kind of ding dongs, and sometimes I get somebody on the phone who was really, really helpful. So um, yeah. you can't actually call the copyright office, and if yeah. you don't, and if you don't complete your copyright registration form correctly, sometimes they'll call you or they'll send you an email and say, "Fix it." Yeah, mm -hmm. I know because I've screwed it up. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's these are great practical tips, Danielle. If you had to give one piece of parting advice to artists, uh, what would you say? Recognize that while you are creative, your art is a business and treat it as such. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so very much. I'm saying that all the time, but now you're saying it too. Absolutely. And it's a big business, everyone. It's a big business. And now the tides have changed, and unlike before, and the creators can get a piece of the pie. We can own our own distribution channels and make in direct contact with our fans and our patrons, and um, we don't have to go through a gatekeeper like before. So we really ha it's even more important to understand the business aspects, which means the legal and fi financial and accounting aspects of your enterprise. So... Thank you so much, Daniel, for the work that you do. And I'm um, looking forward to partnering with your organization to get free training out to artists in your area. And I um, just want to thank you again for your time because she's yeah. – it, it's dinner time where you are, right, in Kansas? Yeah, getting ready to. Going to make some pizza. Okay. All right, cool. Thank you again so very much. And I'll be in touch soon about um, the training, and I'll let you know when this is live on okay. – and you can share who with ever, any other artists who would benefit from these tips because they're they're great. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Take good care. Bye. Bye. -bye.